record. And um, so uh, it's going to be later uploaded to the center's YouTube channel. I want to invite you to keep your microphones muted throughout the program. Please feel free to turn your cameras off if you have any concerns about privacy. Now, without further ado, let me introduce our two speakers today. Jordan Finkin is rare book and manuscript librarian at the Cloud Library of Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati. Before uh, joining uh, HUC, he was the Cowley lecturer in post-biblical Hebrew at the University of Oxford. He is a specialist in modern Jewish literatures and Hebrew and Yiddish poetry. And he is the author of A Rhetorical Conversation, Jewish Discourse in Modern Yiddish Literature, An Inch or Two of Time, Time and Space in Jewish Modernisms, and Exile as Home, The Cosmopolitan Poetics of Late Nidus. Um, the most recent um, book that came out in 2017 for HUC, among other publications. Uh, Jordan is also a literary translator his translation of Leib Rashkin's novel, The People of uh, Godel Bojitz, appeared in 2017. And Dr. Finkin is the founder of Nidus Press. Deborah Kaplan is Associate Professor of Theater at Baruch College, CUNY. Her research focuses on Yiddish theater and drama, theatrical travel, and Jewish performance culture. She is the author of Yiddish Empire, The Vilna Troupe, Jewish Theater, and the Art of Itinerancy. Um, that came out in 2018, and it's a recent winner of the MLA Fenia and Yaakov Leviant Memorial Prize in Yiddish Studies. Professor Kaplan is the co-founder of the Digital Yiddish Theater Project, an initiative to develop a digital portal for Yiddish theater, and she's currently working on a biography of the Yiddish actress Molly Pykin. So, uh, Jordan, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Francesca, and um, thank you to, to CUNY and to Francesca and to Deborah, uh, to everybody who's here today. Um, it's really uh, both an honor and a, and, and a, and a pleasure. Uh, and it's equally a pleasure because I get to plug my press. So, it's, so you know, I mean, that's, uh, uh, who's gonna complain? Um, so, uh, I, I just, I'll, I'll start the ball rolling just to give you a little background about where the Nidus Press is coming from. What's, what's the, and then, and then maybe we can, we'll, we'll open it right up to our conversation, Deborah, if that's okay. Um, so my first professional incarnation um, uh, was as a scholar of, now I'm a librarian, but my first incarnation was as a professor, a professor, sorry, a, a teacher of, uh, a scholar of Yiddish. Um, and all Yiddishists, I think, or at least all Yiddishists in um, Anglo-American, uh, in the Anglo-American Academy, are in some sense amateur translators, right? And I imagine that it's probably the case for many scholars of, you'll pardon my French, minor literatures or smaller literatures. Um, that, you know, close reading requires chunks of texts and it, let's say 2% of Yiddish literature is in translation, uh, in English translation. Um, what else can you do but translate to give the reader what, right? Then you can't presume that anybody knows Yiddish um, the way you can presume uh, uh, if you were a professor of English, let's say. Um, but that translating is not a skill that graduate programs, generally speaking, provide. So um, and, uh, as an aside, I'll mention that that 2% number is a ballpark figure that's generally used. 2% of Yiddish is, is translated. Um, but I've heard from other, um, you know, and that seems an infinitesimally small number, right? I mean, the wealth of Yiddish literature. Um, I, I've heard from translators from other, again, smaller languages that they kill for their literatures to have that kind of representation in, in translation. So maybe it's a really large number. Uh, uh, who knows? Um, but if 2% is what's translated, then the canon, what exists as an option for, uh, for teaching, for reading, for writing, 
um, is a very skewed representation of the literature. It's a very strange canon indeed. Um, so returning, returning to me, it's all about me, right? Returning to me, um, I was a scholar of Yiddish and I will say that Yiddish in the academy is not a growth industry. So um, I was then no longer employed in uh, the academy, but I was finishing my second book, um, sitting in a library, and I felt that I needed to keep my Yiddish skills up. So I tried my hand at translating the, the people of Gödelbüchitz, the dimension from Gödelbüchitz. Um, you might ask why I chose that book. Um, to be fair, it was because it had a funny name. I mean, an interesting, curious, mysterious name. And I thought, okay, fine. Well, it might as well be this than as anything else. And it turns out uh, it was a, a good choice. It was a, a hell of a book. Um, and it kept my Yiddish pretty up to snuff. But when I got done with it, I said, okay, now I've got a Gesunde book in translation. And it's pretty good. Other people should read it. I think there would... I. I think, what do I know? I don't know from a market, I'm a scholar, not a, a marketer. So I, uh, I started looking around, who's gonna publish this thing? And it did get published. So that's, um, that's our main, right? But um, it turns out that translated literature in general is not a hot commodity. And translated Yiddish literature, you can imagine. So it got me thinking. I started working on parallel tracks, uh, both as a, attempting to re-enter the academy, which didn't happen, retraining as a librarian, but then also thinking about Yiddish translation. And to take another sidestep, um, one concern, the idea very inchoate uh, was maybe there should be a press. Maybe there should be a single press, well, there should be many presses, but at least one press that is devoted singly to this purpose. Now, there's a concern that I hadn't really thought about until I started getting more deeply into the world of translation, translation studies and translators, people who either make a living or do it as a dedicated avocation. Um, of uh, par parochialization. Um, and that's to say that, is it better to put all your energies into trying to get trade presses, small independent publishers um, to recognize and publish more Yiddish, to get Yiddish to be accepted as part of that wider world? Or is it better to put your efforts into getting the very best of Yiddish translation out into the world, create a space for it that way, and then maybe God willing, acceptance will live a sort of a Fabian notion of Yiddish literature uh, into the wider world of translated uh, publishing. Um, I, I, obviously, I'd like the former to be the case, but I very quickly found that that is not a likelihood in the near term. And in the near term, there are translators working and producing and not getting published, and that's a great backlog of good stuff. So that was the other impetus to say, well, we need a press, we need a press. Um, and so I um, did some digging and poking and one thing led to another and, and I founded the press. Now. It's not an ideal situation because in Kemach and Torah, right? There, you, you need shekels to make an operation like this really, really work. Um, for the first book, Amen, we had um, some donors who were interested in, and made it happen. But it's not just money, it's distribution, it's all these other things that I'm currently working on getting more robust for the press. Um, but it's been an eye-opening experience, not only for the world of publishing, but for the world of translation publishing and for the world of Yiddish. 
I'm looking at Yiddish in a very, very different way than I used to. It's exactly the way that I look at as being a librarian, very different way of looking at a library than the way I did as a scholar, right? I mean, and so uh, there's a lot of, um, there's just a lot of really great stuff out there and it needs to connect with its readers, right? I mean, I, I and, and we're, the other thing is we're a nonprofit press. So everyone donate because it gets, uh, you get tax exempt status for your donation. So, you know, uh, just putting that out there. But the question was whether it should be some other kind of corporate, but the, the point is you're not gonna make money at this. So I think that as a librarian, you're taught to think not a, necessarily only about your users today, but about what the needs of your users will be 20, 40, 60, 100 years from now. And so I wanted, uh, I wanted Nidus Press to produce something durable for an evolving readership, right? And that means profit can't, be, can't play a part in it and it has to be, it has to be hopefully something uh, more uh, enduring. And so we live on the sufferance of our of our benefactors, um, as as does Jewish studies generally. So it's it's uh, what's new, right? So, um, but that that that's sort of the genesis of the project. But uh, if uh, if we want to open up the conversation, Deborah, or if there, yeah, then that's fine. Sure. Let's do that. Well, Jordan, thank you for it. That was a really interesting. That was a fascinating introduction. I think it raised a whole bunch of questions that. Um, and topics that I think would be really worth talking about. Um, the first thing I'd like to ask you about actually is the name of the press. Um, I'm, I'm really curious to hear a little bit more about how you came to name the press and how you saw the process of naming a press, right? Which is different than naming a book. It's, it's sort of naming a, a corner of the Yiddish publishing universe. So how did that come about? Well, you know, I, that's a, thank you. It, 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 it's not a sexy name, uh, I realized after uh, having uh, done all the legal work to get it incorporated, because people don't know how to pronounce it. And that's a problem. So mea culpa. Um, but you go onto little small press websites, right? And it's, it's kind of fun. You, you look at their, well, their printer's marks, but their colophons and the, the style and the design and the name and how they brand and all that kind of stuff. And it, it, it's just a, a fascinating world of, of uh, creativity and, and design and, and that sort of thing. But in the short term, I had really recently uh, finished the manuscript of my third book, which is a study of the Yiddish poet Leibnidus, who was, uh, he, he died very young at the age, I think of 27, but he was a, a remarkably productive and creative uh, Yiddish poet. He was an aestheticist. Um, so it was art, it just this, uh, everything for him was French symbolism and sonnets and all this kind of stuff. And I thought, how unlike anything we are taught to think about Yiddish, right? We are not taught to think of Yiddish as, as uh, neo-romantic aestheticist uh, um, art for art's sake kind of uh, enterprise, right? Um, and so he, he became just this, it's just a fascinating and beloved figure to me. And so I thought, oh, well, maybe, maybe I can sort of consolidate this, a new look at Yiddish, a new way of of looking at Yiddish. And it didn't hurt that in one of his books, and I'll show you, cause I think it's on the back here. In one of his, he was very into, um, he was a cosmopolitan, but he was very into um, ancient culture, Roman world. And in one of his books, he drew a self portrait as a, a sort of Grecian youth. And you'll see here, that is his self-portrait. And, and I said, I got a colophon. It's done. I don't have to pay a designer a penny. 
I just steal it and stick it on my book and on my press and we're good to go. So it was kind of a ready-made, uh, it was a ready-made uh, done deal, it was a fait accompli. Uh, and, and so it, uh, in short, well, actually that was in long, but in short, that was, that was where, that, where that came from. That's wonderful. It really does look like it was made for that purpose. Um, and that's a pretty remarkable story. Um, I, I'd love to talk a little bit about going back to, you know, the state of Yiddish translation today um, and what you mentioned about, you know, that 2% number, 2% of Yiddish literature has been translated, right? 98% has not. And I wanted to just talk a minute about genre because I think, um, you know, that there's another whole set of questions around what gets translated and what does not that have to do with genre um, and type of writing, right? Um, and so, you know, we could, we could, talk about translation of Yiddish novels versus poetry. We could talk about translation of Yiddish poetry versus Yiddish drama, right? Um, so I, I'm curious just to hear some of your thoughts and reflections on the question of genre and also, you know, related to that, um, how you see this press in relation to genre um, and, and how you're thinking about what kinds of work you might want to publish as, as a press of translated Yiddish literature. It's it's such a wonderful question. It was actually a question I wanted to bounce back at you uh, as a theater person to talk about specifically drama because I have I have some concerns and questions about about <laughs> drama specifically. Um, but it's a really good question. So I as I started getting more interested in um, uh, translation, I started poking around at um, what are there any databases of Yiddish translation, uh, English translations of Yiddish literature. Is there any material that we can actually use to support both that claim of two percent, notional, or but in a real academic sense of what's actually out there? And as I started, Yivo put out something I think in the '60s or something like that. And it's very, it's very strange that there isn't more. And so I'm, I am now compiling. I'd like to get it's a, it's a hell of a lot of work, uh, compiling a bibliography of English translations of uh, Yiddish literature, of course. But the, pr the problem is exactly what you say is a problem of genre. What, are you what is literature? What are we counting as literature? And you have to cut the pie somewhere. I mean, it, it's, everything is, is impossible. For my press purposes and for the purposes of the bibliography, it's belletristics. It really is. Um, but again, even belletristic material is a problem, like what, 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 do, what do we mean by that? Um, so a short story, a collection of short stories, a novel, pretty straightforward. Um, theater, pretty straightforward. Uh, poetry, mostly pretty straightforward. Memoir, okay. Now we're starting humor. Okay, there's a problem. Folklorics. Uh, okay, there's a problem, right? Uh, it it starts to unravel very quickly. Um, so I'm using a sort of a classical notion of of belletristic literature with a with a catch. So obviously, our first book is is poetry, uh, and I, I I don't think anyone would quibble about either its literary value or its uh, uh, or about its literary value. That's fine. Um, but yeah, I mean, genre is a problem because I had uh, I had thought, okay, it's just going to be novel, short stories, of poetry, and and maybe maybe theater, maybe. But that's a question I have, right? Um, there's there's theater, and then there's theater, right? I mean, there's theater that's meant to be. With, do you read a drama the way you read a story, or is the physical copy of the drama that you're reading? just a pony for what's meant to be produced on the state, right? I mean, the act of reading is not the act of-, of That's exactly right. Drama right. is a blueprint, right? It's not, it's like, it's like a drawing for what's to come. It's not the thing itself, right? Which, right. which does think, present translation challenges and other challenges. Yeah. Well, exactly. And so, uh, except for the most attuned, you know, director who can sit down with a score uh, of Wagner and say, um, wow, this really is a lot better than it sounds. Um, right, you pick up a you pick up a drama and you have to imagine the performance of it 
Whereas this is intended to be sat down with, right? Uh, and and even we think if- it's tricky, right? Because I, you know, in many ways, um, Yiddish drama is, you know, most Yiddish drama is getting read now and not performed, right? That's so. There's, you know, there's a way in which, you know, in the time of Peretz Hirschbein, right? Most people who encountered his plays were encountering them on stage, but today, most people who are encountering his plays, vast, vast majority, are encountering them, encountering them as literary texts. And you know, some writers stand up better in that environment than others. Um, but yeah, it's it's a great question. And 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 and, and I think that there were plenty of dramas that were actually written to be read and not yes. to be performed, which is a whole, I mean, it, it really, it's, it's, it's a can of worms I had, haven't had to open yet because I, um, the press is still very young. We only have, well, we have one published project. We have one project in the works, which this is why I did begin to open the can of worms uh, is, a, is a memoir. And I hadn't thought that I would, I had thought that that would be a genre that, not to be, say that it's trife, but that I'm not going to, that's not part of my uh, remit. But it's a, it's a memoir of a literary person written as a kind of literary product of his youth. So it's recreated in the, it's got, it's meant to be a literary overlay of a memoiristic, it, Right, and I, and the more I read it, the more I realize there's a lot of fictionalization involved. So it's it's less less problematic. But it's but moving back to that Evo bibliography, I'd say easily half of the works, maybe not easily half, forty percent of the works at least, if not more, are translated memoirs. What counts as translated? They they had a much broader spectrum than I would have. Um, of translated material into English from Yiddish literature is uh, is a memoir or history cum memoir or memoir cum history, however, whatever the right way of stacking those words, um, which is fascinating to me. I mean, there's just huge, and even today, I'd say that if you look at, at the kinds of things that are being published, not necessarily in America, um, but in Europe, certainly, memoir is a huge proportion of translated Yiddish work, right? So um, it really genre is a really problematic. Not problematic. It's not. It doesn't pose problems. It poses interesting challenges uh, and intellectual uh, avenues uh, to sort of think through uh, what you're actually doing, why you're doing it, who you're doing it for, right? Um, and so, uh, and theater too, I, I, again, that was the thing that, that came up uh, when I thought through these things, because to produce a book like this as a drama, right? Has a totally different feel to it. Like the purpose of it, what's the purpose of it? Right. Well, and it potentially um, has a different community of readers and a different kind of reader that's looking for different things, right? So, you know, I, there's there's also a question. There are trans in play translation. There are translations of plays that are clearly meant to be read in in the construction of the thing, right? Where there's you know sort of like a literary introduction. There's notes on language, things like that. And then there are translations of plays that are meant to be performed. And sometimes they overlap. Sometimes you have both. But the apparatus of, of that structure can look very different, right? So, you know, there are translations that have notes on performance, um, notes on staging, that have that have notes on historical past stagings, right? Like there are little hints in the way that 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 a translation is written that can suggest whether or not it's being transla- translated with the intent of being performed. And also I would say that theater translators, you know, translate somewhat differently when they're thinking about performance. Um, because you have to translate for the voice, you have to translate for the spoken word, which is different than translating for the written word. So there's there's an intentionality there that can actually, I think, radically shape what the translation is and how it works. Um, I, I think that's the and and you know, the the more prose that I translate, the the more I realize I can get away with a lot of maybe not howlers, but I can get away with quite a lot. Because you read a 300 page novel 
one sentence that's not quite right, you just get over it and you move on. But two clunky, I mean, real clunky sentences in a performance can throw an audience off. It can throw Definitely. the actors off if it doesn't, right? It's like when you're listening to uh, um, a, a piano work by Brahms and someone's just pounding out the stuff and you think, this is fantastic. I don't care if there's a note out of place because this is fantastic. But if you're playing Mozart, it's so crystalline, one note out of place and you think this guy doesn't know what the heck he's doing, this pianist, right? Yeah. So and, it, yeah. it, it really is, it's, it's one of those. And there's an immersiveness to the art form too, right? Because you know, as an audience member, if you're watching a performance, you wanna forget that you're watching a performance. You don't wanna think about a playwright or a translator or an actor for that matter, right? If you're in representational theater, you know, the goal is for you to kind of really fully internally believe on some level that the actor is the character and that there is no playwright and that these are real people doing real things. And then the emotional impact resounds. But the moment you get popped out of that, you know, it changes the way that you see the whole thing. So I think that's exactly right. The, the stakes are a little higher <laughs> um, in terms of those little moments. And, yeah. and that actually, it dovetails into another concern I had, especially with this first book. The one question I got asked more as I was planning this thing out was, are you gonna have the Yiddish alongside it? Is it going to be Yiddish alongside the English, right? And I think exactly in that crystalline concept, right? And the idea of uh, parochialization that I was talking about before, is this going to stand on its own Right. Yes, there's always going to be a nudniki Yiddishist or poet or whatever who says, no, I want to look at the, I want the original. I want, and believe me, as someone who reads poetry in translation, I do want to have the pony there that I can sort of uh, go back and forth and really, you know. but the likelihood of the, of an average reader, right? Um, knowing enough Yiddish for that to make a lot of sense, not just a little sense, but a lot of sense, relatively small, but it's also distracting to reading the text fluidly on its own as an unmediated literary product that is meant to engage your imagination and your, right, the, the, the literary reading or the experience of the text, it, it's, you know, it, it, it's like reading a, a translation that, that half of its footnotes, right? That the, Nabokov said, uh, one of his, I think in the, the bit about Igor's campaign or something like that, that the ideal translation is as literal as possible. And even if it's a line per page and footnotes the rest of the page, that's the ideal. And I said, for whom, right? To read this text, to read Kulbach's text like that is absurd. Um, so that was a that was a challenge to try and figure out whether or not we are going to do that. And I think I hope uh, I I made the right decision. Of course, everything is downloadable now, so you can find the original online and and do what you want to do with it. But uh, but uh, I, I think it's I think I want the, I want my works to stand on their own, uh, on their own two feet and uh, and disintermediate them, if you will. Or if I you wanna, want, <laughs> I want to ask a few more questions about just you know the process of choosing what to publish as a press um, because that seems you know it, obviously there's a limit to how much work you can produce at one time. Um, and there's so much that needs to be translated. Um, and in, in many ways, I think, you know, we, you talked a little bit earlier about literary value, figuring out what genres to translate and what types of things to translate, what has that sense of literary value. And I think in many ways, choosing to translate something um, is a statement of its value, right? If, in it, the act itself is a selection and a statement of its value. Mm -hmm. It's also an investment both on the part of the translator and also, you know, a, a really concrete investment on the part of the press. Um, so I, I'd love to hear you reflect a little bit more about what you're choosing to translate. And then I wanted to also introduce kind of as a corollary, right? Um, you know, questions about retranslation because, you know, one of the challenges of, of translations of Yiddish literature to my mind is that, 
there there's a lot of work that's been translated but not necessarily in the way that I as a translator would want it to be translated and I feel like as as a as a professor I mean this constantly I'm constantly saying you know here's this you know this translation is kind but it's from 1924, but this is what we have. So here you go, you know. Um, and so, you know, dated translations, right? Um, translations that 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 didn't quite get at the meat of the of the of the thing itself. You know, how are you balancing choosing what to translate, and how are you thinking about translating things that have never before been translated, which I think is very attractive to like funders and grant agencies and whatnot slash, you know, retranslating things that have been translated, but not necessarily at the level or in the way that that we would maybe prefer. Um, so there's a simple answer to the first question. And I can complicate it with a, a longer, more convoluted answer, um, which is my way. Um, we're still a young press and we don't have a lot of money. So I haven't had the challenge of really having to work through that problem yet. I started off with a little pot of money and I knew that Robbie, Robbie Adler Pekarar, who um, we were in graduate school together. Um, he was a professor at uh, Colorado Boulder. Um, and he is now the director of Yiddishkeit, which is a fantastic, um, truly fantastic uh, Yiddish culture and educational institution in Los Angeles. They do really innovative, wonderful work and Robbie is, is fantastic. But I knew that he had worked on, on this text um, in uh, graduate school and I knew, I knew he, I thought, I then knew, I knew he'd worked on it, thought he had produced a translation. And I, when I thought I had this pot of money and what am I gonna do? I instantly thought because Kulbach is a virtuoso poet, right? Which is the hardest thing in a lot of ways, the hardest thing to translate well. And if anyone's gonna do it, Robbie was gonna do it. But I wanted Kulbach especially um, uh, just because he's one of the greats and under, I think they're truly underappreciated. Um, and it's such a good poem. It's a long poem, it's narrative, it's dramatic, it's got, it's got this expressionist thing, it's got the, the blutmai violence. I mean, it just, it covers all of this. Um, and a, a Yiddish worker in Berlin in the Weimar period, I mean, it's, it's got everything. Um, and so it never been translated in English. So that, as you say, that is a really important, not that retranslating isn't important, but for my purposes, increasing from 2% to two and a quarter percent is important, right? Every incremental bit, it really is, it really is important um, that every new voice gets, um, uh, Gets, so every new voice gets a hearing, but I get to be the arbiter of quality, both the quality of the original and the translation, right? So that's, that's my responsibility. And that's the gatekeeper role that I feel like, I feel like I wanna have as a publisher, right? I mean, and that's, it might be a little Kreuzhalterei on my part, but, but I, the more I do it, um, the more I can tell a great translation from a workmanly translation from a crappy translation, right? Which is not so clear necessarily at first glance, um, especially with modernist texts, where you really have to know what the mechanism is that's being worked out, right? I mean, uh, there's some really weird stuff out there. And if you just want to keep it really weird, it can sound that way, but it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily good. Okay. So that, that um, uh, um, and now I'm in the weeds, but that's fine. Uh, that was, the, that was the, my thinking with this text particularly, um, that uh, it really is a matter of, uh, uh, of choosing the best and the, and the newest in the sense of unseen before. Now, interestingly, this had been fully translated not too long ago, 
I've got it here somewhere in German, but never fully in English, which is bizarre to me. It's just bizarre. And um, now to the question of retranslation, um, I don't know who said it, but there is the idea that every great work deserves a new translation for every new generation, right? Every generation has its homework, right? So goes the, but I said, that's fantastic for Homer. For Yiddish, where 98% hasn't been translated yet, really, we need another translation of Sholem Aleichem? Another translation of Sholem Aleichem, really? Right? Like I said before, 2% is a very skewed concept of the canon. But what's the canon to the, so we're to, not to Yiddishists, what's the canon to the average American reader who knows what Yiddish is? Isaac Singer and, and Shalom Aleichem. Right. That's, that's a crazy canon, right? I, in, my, in my book. Now you could go back to the 30s and say, well, what's the canon? It's uh, Peretz and Sholem Ash. Also a crazy canon, right? God for Nekome, God of Vengeance is a fantastic play, but it's not a representative sample of, of Yiddish literature for all its greatness and all its problematics, right? But, right, so how many translations of Shalom Aleichem do we need? Um, uh, and some of them are terrible and some of them are absolutely fantastic and some of them are workmanly and good in between. But I mean, Who's ever heard of Leibnidus? Right? Well, and I think another factor here, and I think it'll be really interesting when you pull this full bibliography together to see this, because this is a question that I don't think has been adequately answered, right? But, you know, what percent of translations of Yiddish literature are of works written by women, which I would imagine is rather small um, and growing, right? Slowly, but rather small. So that's, you know, that's another question. What is the canon? What gets translated? What comes into play? Um, you know, and and this press, I mean, you know, these kinds of efforts have the, the chance to shape what the canon is. It shapes what gets taught, what can be taught um, and what can be included and seen as important. And, you know, like you said, right, of literary value. Um, so a lot of, interesting questions in terms of what gets translated that maybe this bibliography will help to really firmly answer too. I'm I, uh, one of many questions I hope that it eventually will answer. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, you look at it from the other direction. I mean, look from the, um, to look at it from the, from a, a publishing perspective, right? We look at the state of, uh, of, um, of Yiddish translation today. Um, you can kind of break it down into, um, well, let, let's, let's take aside the, I don't want to call it the ephemeral um, ecosystem, but let's remove periodicals in the online ecosystem for a moment, because they're really, it's a really important and vibrant area where Yiddish translation is occurring. Um, and that may be for an, a different part of our conversation. But the gold standard certainly is a book, right? That's what I produce is a book, uh, you know, something that goes thunk when you, right? That's what we're, we're talking. Um, it's really university presses, right? Yep. Um, but those can be kind of quirky and haphazard, right? That it really relies on a dedicated series if you really want to talk about getting Yiddish out there, it relies on a, on a dedicated series. And up until recently, the, what was that? That was Yale and Syracuse. And Yale went to, they put out great books, but Yale went defunct. And Syracuse, um, the Jewish traditions in literature, music and art, which is not just Yiddish, it's all, but they have done some really, they keep putting out good Yiddish things, but they can only do so many books, right? A lot, some of the memoirs too, right? I mean, so, the, so they're, they're generically all over, which, which is to their credit. Um, and, and also, I will also mention Northwestern because their world, Northwestern World Classics has put out a, a few titles now. Bergelson's uh, uh, yeah. uh, Miritza Dean, which is Judgment, 
uh, Dionysto's Vita Vox, and shameless plug. Uh, my colleague Allison and Schachter and I, Allison Schachter and I have a book coming out with them, a collection of short stories of Fratel Stock hmm. um, from the Jewish provinces. So that, so okay, they they have a a, a growing list in Yiddish, Amen, as they should. What what counts as a world classic? I'm it's, I'm thrilled that, that 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 they're doing that. The other uh, uh, the next is trade presses. Now the thing is, on a purely practical level, right? There's simply no way a translation of a work of Yiddish literature is going to make enough money to make it work worthwhile, even to be looked at by a trade press. I'm not talking about Shevis. I'm not talking, right? Again, I'm not talking that stuff. They're not gonna look at it, right? What's more, the vast majority of the major trade presses require translators be represented by an agent, mm -hmm. even to get in the door. What, y how many Yiddish translators are represented, right? I mean, just practically speaking, it's not, it's not a huge number. And of course, if that's how you do it, right? And there are only, let's say, let's say, three. And they're the only ones who are gonna be published by trade presses, if they get published at all. That's only three people who cover all of Yiddish literature for trade presses, right? So talk about gatekeeping, right? It's what, you know, Heckel, Yeckel, and Schmeckel think is great literature. That's all that gets published by a trade press. It's, it's, it's odd. I mean, it's just odd. And the third are um, small and independent presses, right? As I am, as now there has been a proliferation of small and independent presses on Maine. This is the best thing. This new world is wonderful for that. But those small and independent presses are rarely ex um, expressly committed to or regularly publish works of literary translation at all, right? That's a very small subset that even look at literary translation. And the vast majority of those are almost exclusively interested in contemporary literature, right? Liter the new writing from wherever, which is great. Every, all the voices need to be heard. I totally 100% agree. But what, and what Yiddish may tick the box for an underrepresented language or experience, um, a novel from Minsk from 1930 is not going to be burning to be published by a small one of the small presses, right? I mean, that's just. So I'll just give you an example. Um, I translated a major French novel by a Nobel laureate, and I sent out dozens and dozens of letters to small independent crickets. Just crickets. Now that's a major novel by a major writer in a major language, right? If that can't get even the tiniest little traction, right? Then the prospects for Yiddish, I can only imagine, right? In that, in that environment. Um, so, which is not to say that it can't be done. There are always the, the wonderful one-offs like uh, Ellen Cassidy's um, Yentimash book with uh, Northern Illinois or the Bluma Lempel collection from Mandel Villar, which is wonderful um, that Mandel Villar, a small independent press, uh, put, out something, uh, put out something in Yiddish. But again, it's one-off, it's quirky. It's not, uh, it's not right? I mean, that's, the, that's, that, uh, that's that ecosystem. So again, that's another reason why I wanted to have a press in the mix that says, okay, not just one once in a while, but a lot all the time. God willing, a lot all the time. So the I have one more question for you. A lot all the time. Yeah. I have one more question for you, then I think we'll open it up to the audience for questions. Um, my, my last question for you is I just would love to hear you talk a little bit about readers and distribution. Um, you know, now that you're in this world as being a small independent press, um, how, how, do you, how do you get these books to reach the readers who might want them? How do you think about distribution? Um, you know, what, what have you learned about this and what are, how are you thinking about it now? Okay, the, the wonderful questions. And these are the ones that, that make me look bad. So I will wear egg on my face preemptively. Um, so who are your readers? 
Yiddishists, right? Yiddishists are your, 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 your natural base of support because you don't need to reinvent the wheel for them, right? You don't have to say Sukkot or Feast of Tabernacles, right? Uh, what's a Pripachik? I don't need a footnote to tell you what Pripachik is, right? That, that kind of thing. Um, but it's also a heterogeneous group, right? The 19th century historians are not necessarily the ones who are going to be uh, gaga for avant-garde drama from the 1920s, right? I mean, so it's a, a progressively narrowing group. Um, you can sometimes rely on them to get the word out about something new. And that's the, the networks are fantastic among Yiddishists, but you can't rely on them to sustain the enterprise. Okay, so you need more. Colleges and universities, right? The gold standard is of course, course adoption. Every publisher wants you to fill out course adoption, right? When you publish a book, what courses do you know where they're gonna wanna buy this in bulk? I, it's been a while since I've been teaching in, in that environment. So Deborah, you can tell me um, the likelihood of course adoption as a major, right? Okay. As a major um, driver, yeah. <laughs> so uh, libraries, so within the, that's a, that's a big one. Um, but of course they have to know about you in order to have put a standing order in order, or to get, right? All that kind of stuff. So, uh, and then lay readers. Um, so who are the pe so the question is, who are the people who have never heard of or are generally unaware of Yiddish who are going to go out and buy and read Child Harold of Disney? I don't know. I don't think it's actually, I printed 300 copies. I, yeah, I see Snickers on my, <laughs> I could, um, from my mouth to God's ears. Um, who, who, who are those people? I, I, don't, I don't know who those people are. Um, and that's, that's my fault because coming into this, I still had the mind of a Yiddish scholar and a Yiddish translator. If you translate it, they will come, right? Everyone wants his book, his first or her first book on the academic market to make the splash, get reviewed by everyone or whatever. I can tell you every time my book lands with a pontifical, as D James Matisoff said, with a pontifical thunk, who it is do you think is going to be running out and sticking these in stocking stuffers, right? I mean, that's what you want. So um, uh, that's that was my thinking. If I public, if I if I translate it or I publish it, they will come. They don't come. The market is saturated with fantastic stuff. The, the more of these web lists that tells you how old I am. I called it a web list. I don't even know if that's a word. The more of these listservs that I'm on and I get day announcements on this, I think, I can, how am I gonna choose what to read next? There's a thousand billion wonderful things, right? So how is Child Harold of Disney gonna break into uh, I'm one person and I'm not, I'm not uh, clearly not tech savvy. Um, and uh, the press doesn't have enough money for major advertisements and that sort of thing. So, you rely on what you rely on. Um, I'm currently in, in um, uh, negotiations with uh, another press to uh, get in on their distribution, which God willing will increase the exposure. Um, and that's, uh, it, and I, uh, being a neophyte coming into this, it's distribution is the key. Distribution is always gonna be the key. It's not just an e a list of emails that you send out. I could send it to an email list to the cows come home and maybe one book out of a hundred I'll sell. Um, it's, about, it's about major distribution. And that's the hardest thing to break into as a small independent uh, publisher uh, is, is the distribution because the distribution is not gonna, not gonna be. And I also chose not to be on Amazon. That was the other, probably if I wanted to sell books fast and a lot of them, uh, well, a lot. <laughs> if I wanted to sell more books faster, 
I would have gone with Amazon. But the more I learn about that, the more wary I was of being part of that. Um, sure. Again, again, right? My drive, I want more people to read it. So if I want, if that's my only goal, then I made the wrong choice. Then I made the wrong choice. Um, but I do want to choose works of enduring value that will last longer than the one generation before it needs retranslating. And I'm hoping that as we grow and as the, God willing, and as our exposure, thank you, Francesca, for inviting me and offering this exposure. Um, these conversations about what, what's quality, who gets to read, why they should read, all those kinds of things um, will become more part of our uh, the way we think about what we choose to read uh, uh, and so on and so on. So I think at this point, I think we should open it up to questions from all of you. Um, and I see that, um, Mindel, that you have a question about editing. So if you want to go ahead, I'd, we'd love to hear it. Great. Thank you both. This has really been wonderful. I'm nodding along, Jordan, to everything that you're raising. Um, but one thing you didn't talk much about was the maybe editorial process or philosophy for your press. And I'm curious to hear you speak about that. I feel like it's one of the things that might distinguish a press dedicated to Yiddish from seeking to publish Yiddish translation in more general presses is perhaps what the editors or the press can bring in terms of the editorial attention that the work gets and that there are maybe different needs um, for Yiddish translation today, given that so many of our translators are not native speakers. We don't kind of have the exposure you know, the works are older, all of those things that maybe Yiddish translation needs different kind of editing than, you know, your average brand new translation of a new French novel that comes out. So yeah, I'm curious how you've, how you've thought about that. Um, uh, there's a fan thank you, Mindel. That's a fantastic question then. And, and you're a great editor. So I, I know exactly where those, those questions are coming from. Um, no, it's a, it's, it's, a really good, it's a really good point because there are no born translators. It is all, it's just experience and practice and mentoring and um, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and there are so few native speaker, native speakers of Yiddish, that, I mean, non-Hasidic, non-Hasidic. It's a different language. I'll just throw that out there. It's a different language uh, than the language of the literature that I am talking about. Um, so it's exactly right. So it, it, it's a matter of um, working very, very closely with the... Now, luckily with um, Robbie's book, I didn't have to do much because his Yiddish is even better than mine. Um, but I make it a point to read every word. I read the book in the original when I get a submission. I read the translation. And I am very involved in, uh, I, I, if need be, a sentence by sentence uh, look at the book. Um, because what I don't want to be, I want to be a publisher. I don't want to be a printer, right? I, I, I don't want a work to come in and say, OK, boom, you've got, now we print you and you're good, and right? That's a, that's a glorified self-publishing operation and that doesn't say much. Uh, I, I, I think it's, it's very important to make sure, but you know, but I'm not gonna be dogmatic about it. Oh, you said large where I wanted you to say big and that's not, I mean, that's not, that's not, but, but I mean, I want, I need to make sure that it's quality control. It's, um, it's uh, massage. The thing that I've learned as a translator, not as a publisher, is huh, learned, maybe not internalized, but I've learned, is how to let go of ego. Um, mm -hmm. That almost everything, not necessarily is better in a committee, not everything is better in a committee, but everything is better by collab with collaboration, right? Um, uh, you just, you don't see everything. You just don't see it. Bill Johnston, um, the wonderful translator, Bill Johnston, uh, who's 
Pantadeus just came, uh, just, just came out last year, I think. Oh, it's fantastic. But he was giving a talk, I don't remember where. I, I won't curse, I, I said, but he said, translation is, it's effing choices. That's it. That's what translation is. It's all about effing choices, um, which is the great, the hardest thing and the most wonderful thing about translation, right? It's all choices. But you, sometimes you don't know what the choices are until you're shown them. And that I think is what uh, the editorial collaboration is, is, is aimed at, at producing the best work that, uh, out of the available uh, uh, options. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, I, I think that's, that, that's, that's where I land on the spectrum and that's where Nidus Press, God willing. And we have an editorial board and we haven't had enough submissions that I've had to uh, get them much stuff, but uh, that's what we're dedicated to. So I think that, that we would all take that on board. Great. And we also have a question from Sonia Gollins about what sort of books you would like to publish and goals for the press. Do you want to say a little more? Goals for the, oh, Sonia, did you want to say any more? Is that the question? Okay. Uh, what I'd like to, I, I'd like to publish, I'd like to publish anything great, right? I want to publish anything great. Or I'll take a step back, anything really good doesn't have to be great because I, I'll take a step back, I, I, I rescind. Great is wonderful. Very good is even better. I'm publishing a translation of some poems by Nochem Minkov, a, a book. Um, and he was not a great poet. There are a couple, there are some great poems. He was not a great poet. The thing is that no, even the, the greatest poet doesn't write in a vacuum. They read other things, right? They read the other things around them, before them. Um, so if all you get was the pearls, right? You'd have no notion of what an oyster is, right? Of the context, of the texture, of the possibilities, right? So not that I wanna give you oysters, um, but I wanna give you maybe some faux pearls, um, right? Something that, that gives you a fuller context of the Yiddish, um, the, the Yiddish experience, the Yiddish civilization that produced um, all these works. Um, so that I, I, that might be a, a little uh, nudniki uh, answer, but uh, that 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 I, you know, you know, and I know I have grandiose ideas about what I'd love to publish. Um, you know, the complete works of Kulbach would be great. The complete works of Nidus would be wonderful. Uh, that kind of thing, uh, but and Kemach and Torah. So I'm I'm hearing cash registers ring. God willing. <laughs> um, we also have a question um, that doubles back to you know your earlier mention of minor literature from uh, Rob Adler Pecker about the conditions that made possible a minor literature series like Philip Roth's Writers from the Other Europe in the 1970s and. Yeah, do you think there could be such a possibility for Yiddish and other small literatures today, or I would add in the future? Yeah, do you see maybe there's a moment coming, or what? What do you see about that? Wait, wait. What's the first part again? You spoke so quickly. Oh, I, yeah. So it's, in, it's also in the chat. But um, but what were the conditions that made possible a minor literature series like Philip Roth's Writers from the Other Europe in the 1970s? What were the conditions that made them possible? It was a different time. I mean, uh, just, I, it was a different time. Uh, now, um, now I think is a better time. Um, and so that's kind of why I stepped into the mix um, because uh, now's the time to do it. Um, but I, Robbie, you're, it's a great question. Um, but I, I don't know how else I don't know how else to answer it other than to say uh, um, we're trying to do it. You're trying to do it. You wrote my you trans you. 
this is you, this guy right there, Nudnik. That was the, yeah, that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to achieve. Francesca, do you have a question? I do have a question. And it's uh, it's actually a question about fundraising and about the, the you know, which kind of networks you've tapped into and what sort of... Uh, resources you're you know you're trying to use to to fundraise and the question comes because more and more recently i've seen people using kickstarter to self-publish and they seem to be extremely successful like they raise very significant amount of money because they manage perhaps through targeted ads you know some of these uh, kickstarter campaigns come up on Facebook or Instagram. And so they, they seem to tap into certain communities of interest. So I'm curious if you've thought about using that, you know, that networking and how you've been raising the resources that you need to, to put these books out. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a fantastic question because that, that other than distribution, right? That is the, that's the whole, that's the whole problem. Um, I, uh, these are personal networks that I've, I've leveraged to, to put out the first book and what we've done so far. Um, and it's hard because I have a day job, right? I mean, it's a, uh, uh. <laughs> uh, the other problem is very often, no one's just good, no one. Few people are just gonna give to the press because they love the press, even if it is a nonprofit. They want to support something. So that's exactly right. So you need a project to entice them. The problem is you don't have a project until you have someone committed, right? Effectively under contract. But if you don't have the money to start, right? To commit to the project in the first place, right? It's bad faith to enter into a contract you can't live up to, right? So you have to amass a certain amount of capital and investment in the call it the press infrastructure and distribution and advertising um, before you really get underway and we are still so small that it's very hard um plus yeah uh yeah, I, I'll, I'll leave it at the, I'll, I'll leave it at that point. But I, I would absolutely uh, love to entertain that if there was a way of um, of uh, of ensuring that that was a, a um, mutually beneficial. Do you see what I'm saying? Kind of a kind of a situation. A uh, fundraising is the hardest. It's the uh, distribution is the hardest nut to crack, but fundraising is the hardest thing actually to do to go out and Schnur, um, cause I, as passionate as I am about it, uh, you know, there are not so many um, Mr. Gottracks who are just waiting to pony up the dough to say, hey, here's, I don't know, $50,000, Mazel Tov, make some books and put my name on them. That's, are you out there, Mr. Gottracks? You know, and that's, a <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it is, it is a, re, it's a major problem. And so the, the ideal is that you sell enough books that you parlay that into the next book and you parlay that into them. That's the, that's the goal. I mean, that's the goal. And eventually we will get there. I think what's not so far off, uh, eventually we will, we will get to that self-sustaining moment. But it, it takes the it takes the infrastructure and the and the visibility. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Are there any other questions from anybody else out here? Or comments, anything that anyone wants to add? Feel free. I um, if you if you cannot unmute yourself. If you can't put the video on, feel free to use the chat to, to ask your question, or if you wanna just use the hand raise function. Um, yes, uh, Rachel. Yes. Um, I don't have a specific question. I'm just sort of full of ideas and thoughts and curiosity and excitement um, as um, I just had my first uh, book of 
uh, short stories translated from Yiddish published by Syracuse University Press last spring. So I thought that was really interesting. Uh, Jordan, the, you know, what you said about Syracuse, uh, you made a few comments back there. And I'm really just, everything everybody has been saying has been ringing bells with me. I'd like to become, you know, as a translator and as a recently retired academic and so forth, lots of time on my hands. Um, I, I don't know, is there some way that, um, are you looking for people to become more involved? You know, do we just sort of sit in our little corners and be excited about this? You know, is there sort of a, a, a way to participate? I, if I, I wish I could entertain every person who has a manuscript, right? <laughs> um, it, what I would say is, I'd love to see everything. I'd love to read everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, God willing, I'll, I'll get that opportunity. But swamp the, the presses. I'd say swamp the presses. The more they see good stuff, right, the less uh, charity will be of looking at it, of thinking, you know, uh, right? Like, what is this? I don't know what this is. I don't, we don't do that, right? They'll say, no, this is a vibrant community. These are active people. This is, right? Keep translating, right? I mean, that's just, that's the, the more the better. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I've got a, I've got a whole shelf, a, a drawer of, of stuff I've translated that can't get any traction. Um, so maybe there, there will be, um, I have toyed with an online venue. Uh, I want to produce books. I want to produce physical objects. That's my, you know, everyone's got, it, everyone's got an yeah. uh, I, I, I That's what I want. I'm a librarian. I can't think about things that's not a book. Um, but, but I have thought about um, online platforms, uh, uh, data, you know, places where people can go to read this stuff. And there's, there's good stuff. And I'm gonna tell you that, 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 that there, there is an ecosystem growing out there. Um, uh, the Book Center has- Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in Geveb, there's yeah. more, right? And good quality gate kept places mm -hmm. where things can, right? That's not ephemeral, that is out there, that does get um, hits and views and reads and and is in the mix. Um, in terms of traditional small press, clunky, funky book operations, it's just a, it's a, it's a more hit or miss kind of, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So when we, if God willing, when we get bigger, there we'll, we'll put out more. Mm -hmm. um, so I, uh, that's the, the unsatisfying and unsatisfactory answer to your. Yeah, I wasn't so much um, asking, you know, will you publish my next book, which I haven't translated yet. Uh, but I don't know, I guess I'm just thinking, you know, this has just been such an exciting and interesting discussion, you know, who else do I have these discussions with? Um, you know, maybe, maybe just a forum for more discussions of this sort, like, how do you distribute your book? How do you market your book? You know, just, I mean, I've got my, my local Vancouver School of Yiddish translators that we talk to, but, you know, as, in as much as we have a lot of experience, um, you know, there's also a lot of just things that we don't know about. So I, I think a way of broadening this kind of discussion and throwing it open to the translating and editing um, community, generally speaking, would, could be a really useful thing just to share information. And the, the other element of that, that I think that a lot of translators would actually be very, like, something needs to be done, is copyright. Oh, yeah. I mean, all these right. things. I just, I had to work out on my own, you know, and I think we all do. It's the bugbear. It's yeah. the bugbear of Yiddish, I'm sure of many translations, yeah. but of, of Yiddish translation, it is, it is, yeah. it's a swamp. And I, I hate slogging into it, which is one yeah. of the things I have mostly chosen people whose work to translate, whose work is in the public domain. Because That's right. I just, I give up. I know. But yeah, and if there was a database 
who's in the who do you contact? Who's in the public domain? Who that would be a wonderful thing. But again, oi, does, does, does that work. take a, a nudniki mind to put that together? Well, there's so a lot of nudniks more. out there. I think we have two more questions. I see a question from Carol and then a question from uh, David. Hi, can you all hear me? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Jordan. That was fascinating and best of luck for the press. It's a great project. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to reading some of, of these books. And I mean, obviously, uh, I'd be keen to know if you managed to reach a, a Oh, you've gone mute. Sorry, oh, I've gone mute. Uh, um, yeah, I'd be keen to know whether you managed to reach a large, large audience, and so uh, keep us posted. Um, but I was, I was struck by what you said about translation and and the footnotes and what people call thick translation. Uh, just having footnotes and footnotes, and I've seen creative ways of 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 doing this as well, of keeping the original. Uh, but not necessarily side by side. Um, so it depends on you know what genre you're doing. But if you're doing poetry, for example, you might have all the originals in one part of the book and then <laughs> all the translations afterwards, or the other way around. Um, that's also an option. And I've seen I've seen books with four entries, believe it or not, four different languages. Uh, <laughs> so um, there are creative ways of 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 doing this. You don't necessarily need to to ping pong from one you know from source to target uh, and back again no but, indeed. Uh... indeed i haven't explored them but no no i know i know i know what you're i i exactly yes it's a it it will it would take some creative uh design but yeah. i think that that's the world we live in there's nothing but creative designers out there yeah. i think there's so well, yeah but well done anyway <laughs> keep us Thank posted you. thanks great and then we'll go to david for i think our last question Thanks very much. Thanks, Deborah. Thanks, Jordan. This has been really great. Um, so I guess my question is, it goes back to what you were saying about Canon a little earlier, Jordan. And, it, you know, it's probably at least once a week, sometimes two or three times a week that people send in all sorts of inquiries here to the book center. And they're about authors I've never heard of. So I go and look them up in the lexicon. And, you know, they're totally fascinating people who've written huge numbers of novels and published endlessly in dozens of newspapers. And so, you know, it's a question we all think about is how do we know what we don't know? And how do we, we, you know, we've enlarged the canon considerably in the last 10, 20, 30 years from the sort of patriarchal line. Um, but, but there's still a sense that it's endlessly more, as you said, more complicated than we know. And, you know, when a lot of work didn't even make it into book form, how do you think about how to tap the sort of collective wisdom of um, people of previous generations, perhaps, who were thinking about this? Or, you know, where do you, where do you look to think about what great works we may know nothing about? How do you, the question is, how do you know what you don't know? How, how do you try and, how do you go down that path of, of trying to sort of, you know, I mean, pre-war, there was such, there was so much greater a community of readers and people who knew the culture and knew hundreds and hundreds more names than we know. Um, and, you know, and were writing about it to some extent and were, you know, criticizing the critics and reviewers and also that whole literary apparatus of thinking about um, the literature. Uh, and, and our ecosystem, it seems to me, is much diminished from that pre-war um, world as much as we're thinking in different directions. But there's still a huge number of writers most of us have never heard about. I, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful point. It's an absolutely wonderful point. Um, and also the writers that everybody used to know and nobody knows anymore. That's, the, uh, that's another facet of the right i mean and and that was my that was our interest in fraudal stock for example um um and mine and nidus uh, also uh, for that it's it's a it's an impossible question it's an impossible question because it's it's recreating a world um uh, it's recreating a context of reading that uh, this we don't we just don't we don't have um but i i will say that i am always drawn to those writers, the ones that you you say, well, I've never heard of that person. What's what's going on? So I have um, almost finished a translation 
of uh, some short stories by a writer with the unlikely name of Alm Nurholm. Not a particularly Jewish name. There's a little stub in the lexicon uh, that all has no info biographical information. All it has is a few works that were published. Um, he seems to have been a vegetarian, like in vegetarianism, um, and an Esperantist. Uh, and he wrote some, uh, a couple of Yiddish works. Um, and that's it. And that is absolutely fascinating to me. I said, I want to know and read everything by this guy. Or woman, I don't know. It, I, Al Manurham, I just don't know. I mean, I just, um, it, it sparks the, right? Um, and Yiddish is, uh, one of the great things uh, I found about being a Yiddish scholar, right? I originally, when I was in college, wanted to be a Bible scholar. And I very quickly was disabused of that um, path because in order to, no one does Bible, everyone does, right? In order to do Bible, you have to do someone who read someone who read someone who read someone who read someone, 19th century German historiography on blah, 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 blah. Life's too short for me. Some people love that stuff, but life's too short for me. The great thing about Yiddish, the great and tragic thing about Yiddish is that almost anyone you choose, no one has written about. You can create, you almost ex nihilo scholarship on this field and this, right? Um, and it's, it's breathtaking, the amount of Yiddish that was published in uh, overall indeed, but in its heyday, let's say the 1870s to the 1930s. That's the, right? And that's the drawback of Yiddish is that, right? I would only add to that, and that's, that's all you know, fascinating, that, that there are, it seems to me there are people and, you know, my, my equivalent of Leibniz would be Rochel Feigenberg, who seems to me somebody who's been, you know, minimally translated in terms of some short stories, but she seems to me somebody a bit like Nidus, perhaps, who was in a way part of, you know, the canon is, is a sort of loaded word, but she was um, celebrated and appreciated in her time uh, and now has completely sort of fallen off the map of our literary Canon. And, and, you know, Nidus was somebody who, who provoked sort of poetry circles to be named after him and literary societies to be named after him. So there are these people who, who have sort of flipped in terms of their reputation, which is also interesting. Yeah. No, and I, and I you know, I, um, I feel that, um, how do I want to put it? Well, I, I won't go down the road. I, I, it's, an ab, it's, a, it's a wonderful point. It's an absolutely wonderful point. And I think that, um, I, let's put it this way. I don't necessarily want to be the only press publishing Yiddish translation, right? Um, I'd love to be the great press that publishes Yiddish translation in English, but we can only be made wealthier with more wealth, if you see what I'm saying. The more that's out there, the more texture we can give to the context that you're talking about, the more that those names become part of how we understand and appreciate, not just in a scholarly way, but in a literary, in a human way, that we can pick up a huge, any number of a huge number of books and read them and be intrigued by them and edified by them and enjoy them or provoked by them, everything that you want from literature when you sit down um, with, a, with a glass of, of bourbon as I do in the evening uh, and, and, and my cat and you read. That's what I want, the volumes and volumes for Yiddish. And this is my contribution to maybe starting a ball rolling God willing. Right again. I'd love to be the great Yiddish publishing house, a Yiddish translation publishing house. But there should only be more. We're only made richer by more. And that, to add to your your point, that there's only more out there. I think I think on that note, that wonderful note, I think we'll uh, bring this conversation to a close. Thank you so much for all being here in Jordan. It was really a pleasure to talk with you. It's really really exciting stuff. The pleasure was all mine. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you so much, Jordan. Um, again, I want to show you the first book published by Nidus Press. Buy this book so that volumes <laughs> and volumes can be published by Nidus Press. Uh, thank you all. This has been a really exciting conversation. Thank you for being such a wonderful audience. The questions were really, you know, so much food for thought. So I hope that um, you all had fun and and uh, an enlightening afternoon. And I'm going to keep the uh, call open for just a couple of minutes so that if anybody wants to say hello, you can unmute yourself. Um, sometimes just ending the call abruptly can be a bit shocking. Um, and again, thank you all for coming.